Many will be familiar with the concept that volcanoes on Io are not really volcanoes, but instead caused by an electrical phenomenon. How exactly does this mechanism work and why does it produce the shape that it does? In order to understand this, we must examine a paper published by Anthony Pratt, who worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, and Alexander Dessler, who founded the Space Science Department at Rice University. Let's dive in and find out more. When Voyager 1 and 2 flew past Jupiter and took images of Io for the first time, it appeared to be a satellite covered in volcanoes. To the scientists' great surprise, these were not dormant, but appeared to be active volcanoes. Detailed pictures of the plumes from one of the volcanoes were rather striking in that the plume material was ejected in a well-defined cone whose geometry showed converging rather than diverging matter at large lateral distances from the vent and concentrated into striations. We have a volcanic vent with exit velocities of about 0.5 km per second, but with volcanic effluent concentrated into a cone, further tending to concentrate into filaments that terminate on a narrow, well-defined concentric annulus. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, Hannes Alfane directed a program of research on the physics of plasma guns. One of the things that inspired Hannes to conduct this research was to try and understand the origins of the planets and satellites. Thomas Gold was the first person to suggest that the volcanoes on Io might have an electric origin in his paper published in the Science Journal back in 1979. Nearly 10 years later, and both Peratt and Dessler would combine their knowledge of plasma experiments and the understanding of the Jovian system to come up with a radically different model of what might be causing and driving the eruptions. Peratt had worked with Alfane and examined the plasma phenomena created by the plasma gun. A plasma gun, or plasma focus, is a plasma discharge consisting of a short but finite Z-pinch which forms near or at the end of a coaxial plasma discharge. In the laboratory, this is created by switching a charged capacitor bank between a centre electrode and an outer conducting tube electrode. The discharge creates a current sheath, called a penumbra, that forms between the inner and outer electrodes when the inner electrode is at a positive potential, an anode, and the outer electrode is at ground, the cathode. The current sheath is equally well defined. Whether the inner electrode is at a positive or negative potential, but the ion and neutron production at the focus are observed only when the inner electrode is the anode. Part of the stored magnetic energy in the tube and external circuit is rapidly converted to plasma energy during the current sheath's collapse towards the axis. The reason the current flow converges is largely due to the self-consisting nature of the current filament. The constriction of the filament will also cause a heating effect we can break down the development of the plasma focus into three main steps. The first is the initial breakdown and the formation of the parabolic current front. The second is the hydromagnetic acceleration of a current sheath towards the open end. The third is of the rapid collapse of the azimuthal symmetric current sheath towards the axis to form the plasma focus. Let's take each step and examine it in more detail. Step 1, the breakdown phase. This has a radial striated light pattern with a defined multifilamentary structure. This, apart from the obvious radial striations, appears cylindrically symmetric. As the current increases, the end point of this pattern moves radially outwards until it reaches the outer electrode. The current front motion is best described as an unpinched or inverse process. A force is exerted outwards between the centre electrode surface and the plasma current sheath. The filament structure within the focus, rather than blending together, form a finite number of intense radial spokes. These spokes appear to retain their identity throughout the acceleration phase and finally coalesce or focus on axis beyond the end of the centre electrode, forming a thin circular annulus. Step 2. The acceleration phase the current sheath across the annulus is not planar. This is angled backwards from the anode to the cathode. The total acceleration force acting perpendicular to the current boundary leads to radial and axial motion. 
The radial component is outward and forces the current sheath to be annular at the outer electrode. The axial force varies with an inverse square from the axis and leads to higher sheath velocities near the surface of the centre electrode. The laboratory images show clearly the parabolic current front. Owing to the parabolic current boundary, plasma flows centrifugally outwards from the anode to the cathode, along the current boundary as the acceleration continues. Plasma is seen to progress radially outwards and beyond the outer electrode diameter as the current front accelerates downstream. Step 3. The Collapse Phase The third phase encompasses the rapid convergence of the axis-symmetric current sheath to the axis and the conversion of stored magnetic energy to plasma energy in the focus. With this configuration there is no equilibrium along the axis. This means plasma may readily escape actually in either direction. By the very nature of the convergence, much of the gas that the sheath encounters during the collapse is ejected downstream and lost. The gas trapped in the focus is estimated to be around 10% of that originally present. The pinch effect is probably the most efficient way of heating and compressing a plasma. As the pinch induces implosion velocities, the current boundary imparts the same velocity to both ions and electrons, and because of the ion-electron mass difference, most of the energy appears as kinetic energy of the ions. In pinch devices, the ions are preferentially heated. So could this plasma focus effect explain the volcanoes on Io? Plasma in Jupiter's magnetosphere, injected from Io, creates what is called the Io plasma torus. This flows past Io with a speed of 57 kilometers per second. This, coupled with the magnetic field around Jupiter, means the voltage induced across it would therefore be around 400 kilovolts. They have also managed to observe approximately a million amps flowing out of Io. It would therefore seem plausible that the current would tend to concentrate in the volcanic plumes, which would give the current easy access to the highly conductive molten interior of Io. Peratt and Desler proposed that the crust, consisting of sulphur and frozen sulphur dioxide, would be a relatively poor conductor, meaning that the current would be directed to the volcanic vents. If we assume that the available power is equally divided between the four largest volcanic plumes, we have about 10 to the power of 11 watts of continuous power available for each volcanic plasma arc. This is roughly equal to the kinetic energy flux of material issuing from the volcanic vents. A small fraction of this power can account for the faint auroral glow reported by Cook in 1981. Viewed from the North Jovian and Ionian poles, Jupiter's dipole magnetic field is into the screen, while the plasma flow within the torus is counterclockwise towards Io. With this orientation, the electric field is directed from Jupiter to Io. If we examine the volcanic plumes from the Prometheus volcano, we can see that the height of the plume is about 77 kilometers and it has a width of 272 kilometers, and the vent velocity of the gaseous material ejected is 0.49 kilometers per second. The current flow is outwards from Prometheus. This implies the center of Prometheus is an anode. To relate the images of the plasma arc process, we must explicitly assume that the fine particulate matter that makes the volcanic plumes visible is entrained by the plasma. So, as the plasma moves to form filament, we assume that the plasma carries with it small solid particles. Peratt goes on to calculate what the breakdown field would be given the probable atmospheric constituents on Io. On Earth, this breakdown field strength for lightning is 4.4 kilovolts per centimetre. But on Io, this drops to about 0.4 kilovolts per centimetre. This then yields a parabolic sheath velocity of 0.89 km per second. It is at this velocity that the gas and plasma are pushed into Io's upper atmosphere by the means of the arc discharge mechanism. The volcanic material ejected is concentrated into a penumbra whose morphology differs from those of ballastic and shock models in two ways. The first is the radial striations resulting from the electromagnetic pinch and accretion of matter into filaments. The second is the termination of the penumbra on a narrow cathode annulus. Most of the volcanic activity on Io occurs within an equatorial band of 30 degrees latitude, which also happens to be the same latitude that the sunspots appear in, 
and is also the same latitude that Christian Birkeland became interested in after his Torella experiments and caused him to spend a considerable time studying Cairo, where the pyramids are also located. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.